We've been working through a series around this theme of determined faith. Um, I don't think we have cultivated enough determination in our faith. You know, we've kind of had church faith and polite faith and kind faith and gentle faith. But when I read the stories of my heroes in the Bible, it takes determination if you're going to fulfill God's call on your life. It won't be easy. God does not call us to easy things. If you imagine that serving the Lord is easy, you're, you're confused. Doesn't mean it's awful. Doesn't mean you always hate it, but it doesn't mean it's always going to be easy. And it's going to require some determination. And in this particular session, I, I want to just talk a bit around the notion of generational leaders. Um, we need one another. Uh, we, we are strengthened by the presence of young people in our midst, and they are strengthened by the presence of people who have a bit more life experience. Together, we make a difference. The, the, the promise of Scripture is that you can make choices that will extend the blessings of God to the generations who follow you. And my question to you is, are you living that way? No matter your age or your life stage, are you living in such a way, are you conducting yourself in such a way so that the generations who follow you will experience the blessings of God? If not, change. You are either bringing blessings or curses to the generations who follow. There's not a third option. There's not a gray area. We want to be generational leaders for the kingdom of God. I'll start in Isaiah 59 and verse 12 with a passage that seems like a very accurate description of the world we're watching. It says, our offenses are many in your sight and our sins testify against us. Could we say amen to that? Amen. You know, we are a nation with a Christian heritage and yet we are easily one of the, the nations in the world in the greatest need of evangelism. We have wandered so far away from honoring God on the simplest of things, not on complex theological issues, on the most basic fundamentals, we have a very difficult time in the midst of the ecclesiastical community, in the midst of the church community, finding agreement on fundamental principles of scripture. Our offenses are ever with us and we acknowledge our iniquities. Rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, fomenting oppression and revolt, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. So what's the outcome of those behaviors? Justice is driven back. Righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets and honesty cannot enter. There's four things discussed there and each one is inhibited. Justice is driven back. Righteousness remains at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets and honesty is just not welcome. Truth is nowhere to be found and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. I honestly can think of very few passages that would provide a more accurate description of the world we see through our windows. And it's not the fault of the ungodly or the immoral or whoever you imagine to be the problem. I believe that condition is a direct result of the heart of God's people. We've been distracted, we've been ambivalent, we've been many things. But the outcome of that is justice is driven back and righteousness remains rather distant. Truth has stumbled and honesty is unwelcome. And if we're going to change that, if we're going to see that become different, it's not going to be driven by elections first and foremost. It's not about new politi politicians or political parties or new ideologies. It will emerge because of a change in the heart of God's people and a move of the Spirit of God. I continue to say that because until we believe it and accept it and begin to seek that out with a determination that we will not be satisfied with anything less, we won't see it. God does not respond to the casual inquirer. God does not move heaven and earth on behalf of those who might occasionally be interested in him. He said, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you'll be filled. Amen. Two of the most powerful drives in a human being are hunger and thirst. You get hungry enough, You'll do things you would never do without the, the motivation of that hunger. And we have not had that attitude towards God. You know, we, we treat invitations of the Spirit of God as if they're options. We're considering them. We're praying about them. We're thinking about them. And I'm not talking about capital campaigns. I'm talking about fundamental options to say yes to things we read in Scripture that we know to be true and we ignore them. Folks, we cannot live with that kind of privilege any longer. There's a, a, a petulance in that. 
an arrogance in that that is so corrosive. Does that passage seem accurate to the world you see? I was called this week on Monday. I got a phone call to participate in a news program. They wanted some perspective on what was happening in the banking systems. What did a pastor think about that? Why are you laughing? I thought that made perfect sense. And honestly, I was a little bit surprised. I didn't have much time. I didn't have any time to prepare. And so when they asked me the question, what kind of bubbled out of me? I said, three years ago, right now, we were confronted with the greatest threat to our existence of our lifetime. They told us multiplied millions of us would most likely die. We had to shelter in place. We had to completely disrupt our lives. Anybody remember that? You heard that? I said, well, with what we know today, with the, with the truth that is in the public square, not really being debated, not, not being cast about, we can say with some certainty that at that point in time, the government lied to us. They misled us. They manipulated us. It's, it's awkward to have to say out loud. They censored people who had opinions other than the government accepted line. They provided propaganda. They inserted themselves into healthcare, dictating treatment protocols. They forced medical treatments upon us if we were to keep our jobs or to travel or to go in public buildings. And we know at this point, while they were telling us to follow the science, they were not. So we find ourselves in a crisis, a financial crisis, a significant crisis. And our tendency is to turn our faces right back in that same direction and say, what should we do? That doesn't mean the government's bad. It means we're insane. So the more awkward question is as a result of the pandemic and the threat it represented, to what degree did we humble ourselves and turn away from our ungodliness and begin to seek God and orient our lives towards him with a determination beyond anything we've ever seen? And if we did so, to what extent did we do our best to influence the people around us? Or did we just wait for the storm to pass so we could re-enter the routines that we knew? There's not a single answer to that. There's many variations on how we responded. But if we're going to see those circumstances change, it will be because we change. And I would submit to you the biblical word for that is vision. We have to have an imagination that godliness is better than ungodliness. Amen. That honoring God is better than dishonoring God. That obedience is better than disobedience. And the real challenge to that is this enormous cascade of messages that rolls over us that ungodliness and wickedness is far more fulfilling and satisfying. It'll bring more pleasant pleasure and more happiness and more abundance. And you'll be with a better group of people and your life will be better. And we look at godliness as if it's oppressive and intrusive and limiting. It's a lie. And the church has got to wake up. We're embarrassed of Jesus. We got a phone call today inviting us to be on one of the, the local Nashville networks for a discussion of Easter. That made sense. That felt better than talking about banks. <laughs> I thought, I can do that. And we would, he said, okay, what's the date and how many minutes? And you know, because it's a three or four minute deal. It's not a, and, and they said, now you understand this is not a religious program. <laughs> and I said, okay. And they said, well, Easter's about Jesus and his resurrection. Quote, now you're making us uncomfortable. <laughs> you see, we've lost the vision, the imagination, and we have complied with that. We just stepped back. So they're going to take it back to their production team to see if we're safe. <laughs> I think within that portfolio, probably not, but because we're not going without Jesus. It's a little hard to talk about. I offered to take a bunny head and keep it under my arm <laughs> while I talk about Jesus. But we're not leaving our friend out. We have lost our perspective on the kingdom. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, there's a fun story. Samuel's, his life begins as an answer to prayer. 
His mother crying out to God. She's childless and in in response to her prayer, she conceives Samuel. And the promise she made was she would give him into the service of the Lord. So when he's old enough, she leaves him at the tabernacle to serve with the priest. And Samuel is learning what it means to be a to follow the Lord. It's it's an introduction. Many of you know the story. It says the Lord called to Samuel. It's evening time. They've gone to bed. And he said, here I am. And he ran to Eli. That's the priest that's coaching him. He said, here I am. You called me. And Eli said, I didn't call. Go back and lie down. Or I'm going to beat you within an inch of your life. That's not in there. It's just, (laughs) I'm not advocating violence against children. So he went and lay down. And again, the Lord called Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. My son, I didn't call. Go back and lie down. And I don't have to tell you again. Now, Samuel didn't yet know the Lord. This is the intriguing sentence to me. Samuel didn't yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. That's translated in a variety of ways. But the essence of the meaning is Samuel didn't recognize the voice of the Lord. Then Eli realized the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli said to Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood there calling as at other times, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. If you don't know the story, it's worth reading the whole thing because the Lord brings to a very young person a very heavy message about his supervisor. But the part that intrigues me the most is that for Samuel, learning to follow the Lord, vision for the things of God is fundamentally a process of listening. Now that seems like a bit of a paradox that vision requires good listening skills. But if you can't learn to listen to the voice of the Lord, you'll never have a vision for what God is doing. Amen. Throughout scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, one of the most consistent characteristics of the people of God is that they listen to his voice. It's far more consistent than the buildings where they worship or the styles of worship or the, the times of day or the days of the week. They listen to the voice of the Lord. In fact, you just won't find significant people participating with God that don't listen to him in Scripture. So if we're going to talk about vision for our generation, I would submit to you that it's going to emerge from our ability and willingness to listen to the Lord. And in my experience, God reveals himself to those who respond. So if you are intentionally ignoring a point of truth that God has made real to you, you shouldn't expect any further messaging. You see, he's the creator of all things. And we can't just willfully thumb our nose at him and expect him to give us another option. When he puts an invitation before us, the expectation is we will respond in obedience and enthusiasm. Now, I haven't always done that. But that's the goal. It's going to take courage to lead a generation. To be a generational leader will demand of you courage and strength. We've looked at that already from the scripture as we've walked through this series. I'm just telling you on the front end, if you think it takes more courage to to do something in the business community or the academic community or in your social community than you think it takes in your faith, you have not understood biblical faith. If you thought the greatest expression of courage in your faith journey was walking the aisle to recite a sinner's prayer, you have misunderstood. That's a supernatural gift of God to you. That's an expression of grace and mercy. We don't earn it. We don't qualify. We kind of stumble towards it and say, I think I might need something and I understand you might help. And in the midst of our lack of awareness and all that we don't know, God accepts us into his kingdom and begins to clean us up. But it will take good old-fashioned courage to say yes to the Lord and take that faith into your sphere of influence. We have been cowards for our faith long enough. We have. I didn't call your name. I brought you an example of courageous leadership in scripture. 
It's the book of Esther. Many of you will know her story. She's a young Jewish woman. Very highly probable she's a teenager when we meet her. She's not some grizzled veteran. She's been selected to be the queen of Persia, which is a miracle in itself. But in order to secure that position, she has hidden her ethnicity. Do you know where modern day Persia, what's the name from in the modern world map for Persia? Iran. She had to hide her ethnicity. If it was known that she was Jewish, it was improbable that she would have been given the opportunity. And there's a plot that is hatched that all the Jews in Persia will be killed on the, the appointed day. You know, we move forward almost 3,000 years. And you know, the leadership of Iran today says that as soon as they have access to a nuclear weapon, they will destroy the nation of Israel and the Jewish people from the face of the earth. Some things don't change a great deal because it's not about people, it's about spirits. And we have been woefully unaware of spiritual things. We've been woefully unconcerned about spirits that impact cities or nations or regions or people groups. We've just said, oh, I don't know if I believe in that, as if that changes it. Don't you wish that were true? We could just say we don't believe in banks failing. But it wouldn't change it. I don't believe my car's out of gas. You're still going to walk home. And we've had that same childish, not childlike, childish attitude towards spiritual things that, that we'll read something in the scripture and then they go, no, I just don't know if I believe that. I don't know how I feel about that. As if your feelings or your belief changes reality. If that would work, I promise you, I would get up every morning and say, I don't believe chocolate will make me fat. I'd say it morning, noon, and night. It would be my proclamation du jour. <laughs> but I could say it until my, I was hoarse and it wouldn't change the truth. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you want to be notified when there's new content, when we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.